Welcome to our panel on reparations, defund movements, and international human rights. My name is Alicia Varani, and I'm the Gilbert Foundation Associate Director of the Criminal Justice Program here at UCLA School of Law, and I will be serving as the moderator for the panel today. This event is co-sponsored by three UCLA law programs, the Critical Race Studies Program, the Promise Institute for Human Rights, and the Criminal Justice Program. This is the first in a series of events exploring reparations both domestically and internationally. We're excited to dive right into the conversation, so I won't say much more other than to introduce our esteemed panelists, and I will drop their extended bios in the chat. So today we are joined by Tendai Achume, Professor of Law here at UCLA and the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. We also have Yuvraj Joshi, who is a doctoral candidate at the Yale Law School, and Isaac Bryan, Director of the UCLA Black Policy Project. Thank you so much to each of you for being here and being willing to share all of your wisdom on these topics with us. Uh, each panelist will give uh, some short opening remarks and then we will engage in some back and forth conversation and we'll leave time for audience questions for about the last 20 minutes so you can use the Q&A function uh, to ask the panelists questions. And I will turn it over to Professor Achume to get us started with your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Alicia, and thank you very much to my co-panelists as well. So it's it's very, um, I'm very excited to be able to join this webinar on this particular conversation. And my remarks are going to focus on a report that I produced in my capacity as Special Rapporteur and that, that I presented to the General Assembly in 2019. So um, a little bit of background on the role. So as Alicia mentioned, I'm the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance. And what that means is that I'm an independent expert appointed by the UN to provide um, guidance to that body, to UN member states and to civil society actors on different issues relating to racial discrimination and xenophobic discrimination and the human rights principles and frameworks that apply to them. And so um, I, I'm fortunate enough to produce a number of thematic reports every year. And in 2019, I decided to focus one of my reports on um, uh, reparations for racial discrimination rooted in slavery and colonialism. And there were a number of reasons why I decided to have this focus. So um, in addition to debates around reparations that have been taking place in this country, debates around reparations have, have become more live in different parts of the world as well. And there's two big um, you know, or two big events um, that are that are underway that also spurred this decision. One is that currently within the UN system, we are in the decade of peoples of African descent. And so what that means is that the UN system is supposed to be focusing on the human rights of people of African descent. And within the context of the celebration of the of the decade, questions of reparation um, have, have arisen. Um, and then in addition to that, um, next year is the 20th anniversary of the Durban Declaration and, and program of action. For those of you who are not in the human rights world, and for those of you who may be in it and are not familiar with it, this is an instrument that was produced in, in 2001 at the World Conference Against Racism in um, South Africa. And, and this conference, um, World Conference Against Racism, was a very powerful transnational anti-racism mobilization, one that I think actually connects in some ways in terms of spirit to the mobilizations that we've seen say over the summer in the racial justice uprisings where we saw you know transnational energy to really come together and speak out against racism and it was a UN um, organized initiative but one that definitely produced um, really powerful guidance on how we might think about racial discrimination, xenophobic discrimination in the contemporary moment in ways that reflect the structural ways that racism and xenophobia operate, but then also thinking seriously about the historical legacies of transatlantic, um, the transatlantic slave trade and also colonialism as historical legacies that still shape the way that racial discrimination works today. And so the 20th anniversary of the Durban um, Declaration is next year. And so it felt like an important time 
to address this issue of reparations within the UN framework, an issue that is um, very fraught. The debates within the UN are, are, around reparations are very fraught. And there's a tendency among UN member states, the United States included, to marginalize and dismiss issues to do with reparations when in actual fact, international law and international human rights law provide for reparations. And so what I will do now is talk a little bit about the report and then connect the findings on the report to the conversation that we're having about defund and, and some of the other topics that you've Rajan and um, um, Brian will then uh, get into, Isaac will then get into as well. So the report um, starts from the premise that um, reparations under international law and under international human rights law are actually an available remedy that is required. Um, but before uh, saying more about that, it's important to just be clear about what I mean when I'm talking about reparations. So in the report, I explain that reparations have to do with justice and accountability for historic wrongs. So collective and individual wrongful acts of racial discrimination tied to slavery and colonialism, but they're also about eradicating persisting structures of racial inequality and discrimination that have resulted from the failure to address racism rooted in slavery and colonialism. So the project of reparations is not just about justice and accountability, it is, but it's also about reforming entire legal, economic, social and political structures um, that slavery and colonialism enabled um, and that continue to sustain racial discrimination and equality today. So these two axes are really important. And I should also highlight that the nature of the, of the UN report that I produced is really thinking about a global and a transnational analysis that can then be applied in different national um, contexts. So some of you in the webinar may have focused mostly on reparations in the US context or in other contexts as well, but the report is trying to tell a transnational and a global story. And it's doing that for two reasons. Say Slavery and colonialism were transnational projects, you know, they were transnationally incubated, executed, and the collaboration among the different colonial powers was central to structuring how they operated. And the structures that resulted from them are also transnational. And the international law framework allows, it, allows us to get at some of those transnational structures um, as well. So that's just another um, background point that I wanted to highlight. So I want to highlight three main themes from the report, and I'm moving fast because there's so much to cover, but I also encourage all of you to read the report, which is publicly available, and, and I'll put a link into the chat when I'm done speaking. Um, so the first major point that is highlighted in the, in the, in the report is that reparations are a fundamental and established re remedy under prevailing international law and principles. And so too often conversations about reparations related to racial injustice begin from the premise that reparations are exceptional and unusual, but in actual fact, as a holistic and effective remedy for those who suffered a wrongful act, international law actually requires um, reparations and actually has a legal definition of what uh, reparations are. And you find that states, when they breach legal obligations in different contexts, actually routinely provide reparations in different contexts. And there's even been reparations that relate to um, forms of racial discrimination. You've had reparations for um, violations related to the Holocaust and in other cases. Um, so, so it's not as though reparations have never occurred. They're actually required by international law. They happen as a matter of course. And we have to de-exceptionalize and, and normalize demands for reparations because the provisions um, exist. Under international law, reparations can and should take many different forms. So they're backwards looking, they're supposed to be correcting historic injustice, but they're also supposed to be undoing structures in the present. And at least five ways of thinking about what reparations might be are the following. So restitution, which means taking people back to the status they were in prior to the harm, the racially discriminatory harm that was inflicted and where, where restitution is impossible, compensation um, should be provided provided, satisfaction, which refers to apologies, acknowledgements, and other kind of non-monetary um, ways of intervening that can nonetheless restore people, um, rehabilitation, and then also guarantees of non-repetition. So within the international human rights framework, those are a number of different ways, non-exhaustive ways of thinking about the different forms um, that reparations um, might take. 
Um, the second point um, that the report focuses on is barriers to reparations today. So in the report, I highlight some of the legal and political opposition um, to reparations and highlight that, you know, the, the, the disturbing thing that you notice is that where reparations have occurred, including for racial discrimination rooted in slavery and colonialism, the reparations have been... Um, dispersed or kind of engaged with in racially discriminatory ways. So the reparations that have taken place for colonialism and slavery have often ended up reimbursing former um, enslavers or former, former, you know, former colonial uh, powers or, or holders of colonial um, um, power, whereas descendants of um, people who are enslaved, people who experience different atrocities under um, colonialism end up being the ones who don't get any forms of, of reparations. And so racial discrimination in engagement with reparations is itself one of the biggest um, uh, barriers. Another barrier that the report talks about is that there has been what a scholar called uh, Deborah Tom Thompson calls a kind of racial aphasia that characterizes many different parts of the world, a kind of inability to speak about and a, and a, a deliberate neglect of engagement with slavery and colonialism as legacies that still have contemporary dynamics. And this erasure of the connection between contemporary um, forms of racial discrimination and the past make it really difficult to have conversations around reparations because most societies are conditioned and are structured in ways that make it inconceivable that the past may have something to do with the present. And I think um, coming back to the racial justice uprisings and I think some of the insights that my co-panelists will share, one of the exciting things about the moment that we're in is that they are active movements really trying to put on the table how you know, the violations, the systemic racism that we see in the law enforcement context, context, for example, are direct products of the ways that these institutions were structured by um, the, the slave trade, by enslavement and by um, colonialism as well. So this racial aphasia and the way and, and this inability to really confront systemic racism in the present as a product of the past is another barrier um, to reparations. And then I also talk in the report about some of the legal uh, barriers that exist within international law, even though it provides for reparations for different kinds of violations. There's also barriers that exist in international law, and I can talk about more of those in, in Q&A. The final thing I do highlight in the report is, in terms of barriers is actually just lack of political will. The countries that profited most from uh, the slave trade, that profited most from colonialism are also the most reluctant to engage with reparations. And if they were more committed to the cause, we wouldn't be having the kinds of conversations we have to have um, now. And so the report concludes with a number of uh, different recommendations relating to reparations, including uh, rec the recommendation that UN member states should fund a global platform for serious consideration of reparations for slavery and colonialism that would work in tandem with, no with national projects that are seeking um, to advance reparations. Because as I mentioned, these um, structures of injustice were created by transnational projects. And I think it really is incumbent on the UN to create a platform for further study um, and, and to kind of ensure that, that these conversations are moving forward in ways that are well resourced. The final thing I'll say before turning over to my panelists is that the reason why we thought it would be useful to have a conversation about, you know, reparations at the global level and then some of the national um, uh, movements and uprisings that we've seen, especially the defund movement, is because in the UN context, I've been arguing that what we're seeing is movements on the ground actually providing blueprints for concretely what it might mean to begin to undo structures of racial injustice that are rooted in, in kind of um, histories of enslavement and colonialism and calls to defund um, the police, for example, I see as precisely falling in the category of the concrete blueprints that we might begin to deploy when we're thinking about reparations in a kind of structural way that is about undoing um, institutions and ways of organizing society that are inherently racially discriminatory. And so I'm really excited to be engaging with two experts, one who thinks transnationally about transitional justice um, and, and its relation to reparations, and then also another uh, panelists will be focusing more on on defund movements and kind of feeding back into some of the things I've just said. 
So that's a lot and we'll happily say a lot more, um, but I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Yeah, thank you, Tendai. Um, go ahead, Yuvraj. Thank you so much uh, for this event, for this important conversation and for all your work. Um, so to dive right in, we know that these, the summer's anti-racist protests have resurfaced demands for police defunding and abolition, as well as reparations for slavery, segregation, and other racial injustices. These demands are reflected in the refrain, no justice, no peace, which reminds us that peace is not real unless it's just, and that if there is no justice, no peace will follow. Yet, these arguments are not unique to the United States. They are calling for what is internationally known as transitional justice. Transitional justice is how societies move beyond histories of oppression and of violence toward a more just and peaceful order. Often, transitional justice refers to measures designed to address massive human rights abuses, measures such as truth commissions, criminal prosecutions, reparations programs, and institutional reforms. Now in the United States, Black people have been calling for these measures for decades and centuries. Yet even as the United States has endorsed transitional justice measures for other countries, it has ignored transitional justice at home. In my scholarship, I argue that the United States remains a nation in transition, still far from surmounting its racist past. The United States struggles with racism in part because its governments and institutions such as the Supreme Court pretend that a handful of years of racial reckoning have resolved centuries of racial oppression. By contrast, transitional justice tells us that the kinds of wounds that slavery and Jim Crow inflicted take generations to heal and deepen if left unaddressed. A transitional justice lens thus reveals the shortcomings of American solutions to racism and places the United States within a global conversation about reparations. Transitional justice research and practice shows not just why reparations are needed, but also how they are best understood and implemented. While reparations may be pursued as a discrete policy, they are better understood as one part of a larger transitional justice project. Reparations may compensate for injustice and promote reconciliation in ways that other policies may not. In other words, there may be transitional justice work that only reparations can do, or that reparations can do best, which is why reparations are needed. However, reparations alone may not be enough to eliminate the racial wealth gap or the structural issues that created it, nor will reparations address other enduring features of Black oppression in the United States, like water suppression and police brutality. Because there is work that reparations cannot do, reparations need to be pursued alongside other measures. Indeed, there is work that reparations can do better if they are combined with other measures. For example, the beneficiaries of reparations have stronger reasons to regard those benefits as an honest attempt at repair, as opposed to simply buying off their silence, if reparations proceed in tandem with other efforts like truth commissions. Once we understand reparations in this way as one piece of the transitional justice puzzle, <clears throat> excuse me, we can begin to think about their relationship with the other pieces like policing reform. Redirecting resources from policing may be one way of funding reparations for slavery and Jim Crow. It could also be a way of redressing the distinctive and significant harms of policing itself. In other words, defunding may be a means of reparations or it may be a form of reparations. Defund movements can also be understood as transitional justice efforts in their own right. Countries like Northern Ireland have considered demilitarization and the reduction of their police force in light of sustained civil strife, and their experiences may serve as case studies for the United States to engage with. So in short, the United States needs an integrative transitional justice strategy one that pursues reparations and policing reform, defunding abolition, alongside affirmative action, voting rights, judicial reform, and other structural changes. None of these changes alone can overcome white supremacy, yet all of them working in tandem can put us on a better path and transitional justice can help guide that effort. Thank you, and I look forward to our conversation. 
you so much, Yovraj. It's a great transition into Isaac's opening remarks. Go ahead, Isaac. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, those are two very tough acts to follow. Uh, I wish the order had been reversed. Um, but thank you all for this moment. We are at the intersection of a reparations conversation, both internationally, nationally, and domestically in the state of California, and calls to defund law enforcement or reimagine, reinvest, and reconsider the role of law enforcement as we know it as our public safety model. This past year, I spent a lot of time working on California's reparations bill, AB 3121, which was signed by the governor just a few weeks ago. And even hearing this conversation today, I'm reminded that the state of California should not have a reparations conversation outside of the federal government and the country of the United States, but also without an international conversation about the role that the U.S. plays in the dialogue of what rep reparations means. That being said, California still has a role to play as the largest state in the country and the fifth largest economy in the world. California became a, became a state in 1850. And when reflecting on this legacy, we often think of California as a free state. It was a free state. However, California was all but free for Black peoples in California at that time. The California legislature authorized Southern slaveholders to hold people in bondage if they had entered the state with their property prior to statehood. To reiterate, California did in fact allow slave owners to own and subjugate Black bodies despite its designation as a free state. Additionally, California courts rarely provided sanctuary to those who dared to escape and enter our state seeking freedom. In 1852, California adopted an immoral and draconian Fugitive Slave Law Act. This law empowered law enforcement agencies in our state to force former slaves who had dared to seek emancipation back into their chains of bondage. It's especially important to think about that as we think about the intersection of reparations and defunding the police. Furthermore, the California Supreme Court has documented in the Lambert case, Archie Lee ordered fugitive slaves to be returned to their former owners. This ruling was in direct contradiction of California's constitution and one of the many examples that can be recounted to subvert the false notion of freedom for all persons that is so often ascribed to our early years of statehood. Today, the legacy of slavery in California and its afterlives can be marked by several different indicators, including some that have been mentioned already. Redlining, mass incarceration, the largest jail system anywhere in the world, generational assets and unpaid labor lost in California has never been restored. In 2016, for every $1 of wealth a black family had, a white family had nearly $10. And for me, this representation of this legacy is no more visually apparent than the over 40% of our homeless population that is black bodies. Our unhoused, our houseless brothers and sisters living on the street, 40% black, despite the fact that our state is only 6% black. Our city and our county of Los Angeles are only 8% black, right? And to suggest that these are not interrelated or connected would be a false notion. And so the state of California has passed a reparations bill to establish a task force to look at what proper redress could mean to develop proposals over the course of a year. Um, but again, I think it's really important that that task force not rush too fast, have international conversations, have conversations about HR 40 and the role California has to play in the national dialogue and be thoughtful of all the different ways that transformative justice and reparations uh, can take place. In addition to the inclusive criteria of considering what does it mean to be a native California, particularly if we're talking cash transfers, what does it mean to be black? Uh, we know that that conversation has happened quite a bit nationally. And I think we need to continue to have that conver conversation in a way that is inclusive and takes into account the role of colonialism and imperial conquest in the US. And I think some of our international scholars like Dr. Chume can tell us a lot more about that uh, and should be a part of that task force. But even more so when I think about the unhoused population being disproportionately black and how that could relate to the afterlives of slavery. I think about the way that we are policing black bodies, right? Law enforcement arrests since 2012 have been going down every year. There have been less arrests. Arrests of unhoused people have been going up in an opposite direction. Right now, more than one in five, 20%, over 20% of every arrest by the LAPD is a person who is unhoused. And those arrests are disproportionately more black than our unhoused population is already disproportionately black. So having conversations about what defunding the police or reconsidering the role of our traditional law enforcement agencies in society and reinvesting those dollars into systems of care and opportunity, particularly rooted in bolstering the conditions of life
for black, brown and indigenous bodies uh, is a conversation we have to have. And so I'm grateful to be here with this incredible panel to kind of have this conversation, merging the nexus between reparations, defund movements and this moment that we've been living in. So thank you, Alicia, uh, for having us today. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you to all of you. So uh, let's let's get into it. What it, what does it look like? What is it? You know, what can it look like, and what has it looked like? Um, reparations, particularly in the United States, and related to uh, you know this system of mass incarceration. So Tendai, your report. Uh, indicates that reparations requires two fundamental pieces as you touched on. So the justice and accountability piece and then the eradication of structures of oppression. And so I'm wondering um, if all of you could touch on some examples you may have seen of that occurring in response to the atrocities of the criminal justice system, particularly as the war it's waged on black communities. If you've seen examples of that, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. Or, or elsewhere, what those look like or what they could look like. And maybe I'll start with Isaac and we'll go backwards. I think we don't have nearly enough examples. Uh, I think in the current moment, you know, there have been uh, a lot of local mayors and administrators who have been lauded for cutting their police budgets under this defund pressure. But in reality, here in Los Angeles and in most municipalities across the country, what ended up happening was law enforcement agencies that were set to get an increase in their budget at the same time those same cities were furloughing workers uh, and cutting workers just saw that that increase would disappear. So it wasn't a true divestment or a reinvestment and certainly not reparations, uh, not redress. Uh, LAUSD is a, a school district who gave up $25 million from their $70 million police budget, the second largest school district in the country to go directly towards the needs uh, and benefits of black students. I still wouldn't call that redress or reparations, especially with $50 million still going to that school police department. I think the best example I can think of, at least in uh, idea, I haven't seen it implemented as well as I'd like to have seen it, particularly here on the West Coast, but really anywhere in the country is, is the idea of social equity in the emerging cannabis industry, where we have done harm through mass incarceration and afterlife of slavery directly and explicitly in black communities where we sentenced and criminalized uh, something at a greater degree that had equal usage across communities. And now we have legalized it. And there is a need for redress to attempt to mitigate or restore um, equity to the harm that had been done. And that includes automatic expungements, but then a step into business opportunities, into business ownership, into uh, pipelines for economic prosperity that have been denied for black folks in particular in that space. Uh, for decades. That is an idea that's been floated around both nationally in the Moore Act, but in many local jurisdictions, but I haven't seen it take place in the way it should. And here in California, we mentioned the conversation or the need for affirmative action as a thought uh, of an institutional and policy change uh, akin to other reparations mechanisms. And without, without affirmative action here in California, the ban on Prop 209, that also makes it harder to contract businesses or to take race into consideration when uh, thinking about proper redress. So that's a that's a call to vote yes on Prop 16. If you haven't voted yet, you should definitely do that. Uh, but those are kind of the examples that I've seen thus far, but I have not seen anything concrete or hopeful enough to, to set up as a model, just ideas that have been thought of, of ways we can divest from the criminal legal system, uh, defund from mass incarceration and reinvest in care. But I haven't seen a full-fledged uh, model. There's another idea that's on the ballot this year in Los Angeles County, and that's Measure J, a measure for justice that would call for the County of Los Angeles to, uh, in perpetuity, set aside at least 10% of its unrestricted county revenues, that's nearly a billion dollars a year, to go towards systems of opportunity and care that we know will disproportionately impact Black communities for the positive. And that money that's set aside, that nearly a billion dollars, cannot be touched by the sheriff, the DA, the courts, or the probation departments. And so that again is another idea that I think has the potential to have uh, implications that relate to this conversation, but until it passes, until it's set up properly, uh, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna get too far ahead. Um, so maybe I can I can jump in um, and say that I want to, so I want to give two, make two points. 
One is to give an example from another country, from a different part of the world, where there has been a term, an attempt to, see, to seek financial compensation for historic injustices that were perpetrated by police in the colonial context. Um, and so the case uh, involved was, was filed in 2011 in, in UK courts, and it was veterans of the Mau Mau movement um, in Kenya. Um, and the, the claimants, the Mau Mau uh, veterans who were, who, were representing, who were represented and their descendants were basically uh, bringing a claim requesting compensation for assault, battery and negligence uh, and, and claims of torture, you know, castration, sexual abuse that occurred while in detention, while they were in detention, um, when, when they were detained by the UK government in the 1950s. And in that uh, case, the court, the British court actually allowed them the, the lawsuit to proceed and it ended up settling. So there wasn't a judgment in that case, but there was a settlement in which um, over 500, uh, over 5,000 survivors received 19.9 um, million British pounds as, as kind of um, compensation in that, in that one case. So again, I give that example to say that it is not unheard of and it is not impossible for there to be financial compensation for historic um, injustices. But I think when we're thinking specifically about the, the defund movement, one of the things that I think is, is important is the work that can be done by the reparations frame to call attention to the different ways of thinking about society's problems and the different sources of knowledge that we should be relying on to remedy those problems, right? So when we think about police brutality in the US and outside of the US, at the UN level, too often that is framed as a problem of individual bad actors, right? So you have some racist individuals who engage in acts of violence. And what we see in the defund movement is just a strong pushback against the bad apple narrative to say that we have systemic racism that is baked into the very institutions of policing as a result of concrete projects that intended these institutions to operate this way. And if we're going to take seriously solving problems today, we have to look to the past. So here, what I'm highlighting actually is something that I think the international and kind of transnational universe could really learn from what's happening in the US. And then also this, I think, is a point that others, of course, are making that part of what the defund movement is doing, I think, is commun communicating even to liberal audiences that we have to reframe the way we understand the problems if we're actually going to solve them. So I guess I agree with Isaac that it's difficult to point to successful kind of outcomes that are fully complete, but I think it's a powerful success to even have movements be re-articulating what the injustice is and what the solutions need to be. That that itself, I think, is a is a um a win and one that should find itself into official ways of, of describing police violence. You know, when we teach as law professors in the criminal justice parts of our syllabus, can we begin to name interventions as, as ones that are related to reparations rather than just kind of the traditional ways in which we talk about harm? And then the other thing, again, is the kind of the epistemic insight, which is where are we going to get information about how to do structures of injustice? When one of the things that frustrates me at the UN level is when you have UN member states and even UN officials look for experts, so rarely are movement actors treated as epistemic sources about what it might mean to create a blueprint for reparations, right? And I see the defund movement as really pushing back against that and as showing that if what we're looking for is a way forward, it will come from those who are experiencing racial injustice who have to be centered in those conversations. So I guess the second point is one to say that I think um, even if they aren't successes in terms of kind of getting rid of the problems, I think the reframing itself is one that we have to count as a really, really important um, step forward. Yevraj, was there anything you wanted to add on to that? No, all of that, uh, I completely agree and echo. I think I would just quickly mention South Africa, which is often heralded as an example for the United States to follow. And it's just worth recognizing that the South African process, the truth and reconciliation process, still had limitations and has been criticized. Uh, in particular for not paying sufficient attention to socioeconomic factors, looking at the worst abuses, the most blatant violence, and not getting to the structures uh, that supported that throughout, throughout apartheid. 
uh, Mahmoud Mamdani's work here is especially salient. And while we should look to countries like South Africa, which is obviously a very clear example for the US, um, it's there are demands in the US that may be more uh, ambitious, necessary, um, and need to be attended to in ways that other countries have not. And Yuvraj, maybe I'll, I'll stay on you because you just mentioned this in, in the case of South Africa, that there are certain barriers and obstacles, right? So once reparations, you know, people are on board, what are the, the obstacles um, and what are the mechanisms for accountability and enforcement of a reparations process, right? Um, I was actually reading an article about the fact that there was reparations in some form granted to survivors of police torture in Chicago, right, living under a regime of incredible uh, directed abuse to elicit false confessions, right, but that that still hasn't, um, you know, I think it was about five years ago that that passed and it still hasn't really come to fruition or, or manifested in the ways that um, you know, the community wanted it to, the, the victims wanted it to, right? And so what are some of those barriers and obstacles and accountability and enforcement mechanisms? Right. So there are barriers, uh, first of all, many that Tendai has referred to in the, uh, the development of these programs, right? Of temporality, how far back we should look, of causality, often there's uh, pushback about linking the path to the present, Mitch McConnell says, none of the people who were part of slavery are here today. Well, is that an insuperable barrier? Um, the, kind, the scope of harm uh, that we are going to address, is it the most blatant violence? Is it white supremacist structures? Is it education, housing? Uh, what social spheres we will take into account? Um, issues of responsibility, who is responsible to whom? and for what, and perhaps most controversially, the remedies, you know, what is the quantum? How do you calculate? William Darity tells us that closing the racial wealth gap in the United States will take 10 to $12 trillion. Uh, that is the amount of reparations he predicts is that is needed um, to un begin to undo some of the harm. So that those, once those questions have been addressed and they're contentious, um, actually carrying those commitments forward requires oversight. In, in, you need some ongoing mechanism for governments uh, that may come and go to remain accountable um, to the people, to the communities about you know, how to execute those commitments. Um, reparations can very easily become a moment um, in which the state repents and says we are we are putting the past in the past and we are addressing injustices without actually following through on the commitment uh, of the hard work that is more enduring and ongoing oversight mechanisms are need to be built into any uh, reparations program that is going to be effective. And Isaac, um, related to what Yuvraj was just talking about with relation to the California bill uh, on reparations, I'm, I'm curious, um, and for folks who don't know, if you could share a little bit about sort of the path to getting here in California and what that looked like, and then sort of some of your hopes and, and maybe, um, you know, trepidatious feelings about, about the bill. Sure. Um... So to be clear, this bill was proposed by Dr. Shirley Weber in the California Black Caucus before the mur murder of George Floyd, right? Before the death of Breonna Taylor and Rayshard Brooks, Ahmaud Aubrey. Uh, it was brought up at the beginning of the legislative cycle, similar to the Crisis Act by Assemblymember Sidney Kamlager, who uh, had the foresight to think about these things ahead of time. And so this was a journey that was going to be tough through the state legislature, but because of the political window that was created this year, it almost became um, certain that the governor had to sign this and address this. That being said, as a bill makes its way from an idea to bill language to a signed document, a lot of things happen uh, along the road and a lot of voices have input in that process from committee to committee. So my hope is that California can establish a task force that includes many of the voices Tendai just mentioned and those with 
lived experience on the front lines of having been impacted by uh, systems of slavery and their afterlives. Uh, my hope is that that conversation can include international scholars, domestic scholars, Darity, Hamilton, folks who don't always agree on how to solve this problem or address this problem, but to have those robust conversations about what California's role might be in uh, proper redress for its participation, uh, but also linking this with national conversations and not getting too far ahead. My concerns, of which there are many, uh, the governor modified the bill language towards the end to give himself five appointees of the nine people on the commission. Uh, it's my understanding that the civic institution that will house this task force body will be the Department of Justice, which if you think about it, that is you're putting reparations in a law enforcement agency, right? Um, I believe some of those details are still being worked out. Uh, there can be no more than four members of the legislator on the task force. I would recommend not having four members of the legislature on the task force. They can talk to each other all the time. If there are four members, it has to be two Republicans, two Democrats, despite a supermajority in our legislature. That concerns me. And uh, there was also a lot of conversation in the final hours about uh, who proposals should be developed for. Is it American descendants of slaves? Is it all Black people in California? Can you have a conversation about slavery and its afterlives without including all black people. Uh, but even with that, when you're talking regionally and you're talking about, you know, a state reparations task force, you then have to grapple with what does it mean to be a native Californian? Does it mean that you came over during the 60s uh, and migrated to Compton? Do you have to be Biddy Mason's uh, relative or one of the original founders of Los Angeles? Um, or, you know, can you, you know, what, what does that criteria mean? Uh, and some of those are things that are happening in the national conversation as well. Uh, and there's been some scholars that have split over this issue. There have been some um, healthy and unhealthy conversations about this, um, but it's something California is going to have to engage in. And, and my biggest concern with the task force is the one year time frame. The fact that you are supposed to submit a report back to the governor in a year, this is too deep of a conversation, too important of a conversation, I think to rush. And so I'm hopeful that the task force first recommendation, even though I don't know what they're, they've done because they have not been formed, appointed or assembled yet, will be for more time <laughs> or that this, this conversation needs more time uh, so that California doesn't get too far ahead that it actually uh, starts significantly behind where a national and international conversation should already be. So that is how this happened. I do have more hope than concerns. But I thought I would share both um, because unless we voice those concerns and hold uh, folks accountable, uh, a task force like this just becomes rhetoric when it has the potential to be transformative. And so I'm going to hope on the side of transformation and I'm going to push along with many of you uh, to ensure that that happens. I like that, to hope on the side of transformation. I think we all need that that hope right now. Uh, Tendai, I want to invite you to respond to anything that's just been said, but also uh, something that Isaac just mentioned, just sort of around the process of working with community and with people to plan for reparations, right? And is that, can that be a, you know, a process of reparations as well, part of the healing and accountability and what does that, what does that look like and how can that very process be powerful? Thanks, um, Alicia. And, and following on from what Isaac um, was saying, I think part of what makes conversations around reparations fraught um, and divisive, to my mind, is the fact that they're often framed as though they can be once-off engagements with the underlying harms, right? And I think, Yuvraj, you mentioned this, we think of reparations as kind of a moment. And um, I keep coming back to this, but part of what the report was trying to do is really underscore how the project of reparations is about 
undoing structures and remaking societies that were deliberately designed along logics that reinforce racial subordination. And if you bring that whole long history into, into perspective, the idea that you can have one-off interventions that address the problem in any meaningful or deep way is a problem. And, and so I think part of the work and part of the work of, of conversations around reparations, which I think themselves you know, being able to name the harm has re rehabilitative properties for sure. So this is answering the second part of your question, Alicia. I think the um, process of getting there is part of how we should be understanding the entire um, project. Um, but even more than that, I think the work has to be in every nation and in every state or local community where conversations about reparations are being had. Part of the framing has to be one that underscores that it is a long-term project. It's not something that can be done by individual um, interventions. I want to say something um, that is maybe not exactly directly tied to your comment, but is something that I wanted to highlight and that I didn't in my initial remarks. So the thematic, the report that I presented think is, is talking about reparations for um, people who've experienced racial discrimination resulting from uh, colonialism and slavery, people of African descent, people of Asian, um, Asian descent, um, indigenous peoples. And it's really important to keep that in mind as well. And, and, and I know that even though we started talking about California in this particular session, I know that the Promise Institute will have a session that will focus more specifically on California. And we're going to have another session that will engage with indigenous nations and thinking about, um, thinking about reparations in that context as well. Um, but I think it's important to name even in this conversation conversation that in many contexts, the project of reparations is a decolonial project as well, right? So it's, it's about undoing structures at that level as well. And it is, it is incredibly long-term and no one intervention will resolve all of the issues. And it's dangerous when states, when government actors frame it as though here's your one shot and this is it, we're just going to do this one thing and that's the end because it's just not possible. What we're talking about here is remaking society in ways that are fundamentally more just. And that is going to take generations because it took generations to bring us to where we are right now. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Um, I'm gonna turn to a question uh, from an audience member and thank you all. Please continue to submit questions. We'll, we'll answer as many as we can. Um, this question says, uh, African-Americans have consistently used international forums, including the United Nations, to petition for redress for genocide, slavery, etc. With all of the interventions since the We Charge genocide petition in 1951, why has the international community and the United Nations not initiated any process to force the United States to pay reparations? What will it take and what do you recommend that African-Americans and specifically groups like the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America do that they haven't already done to make the international frameworks effective? So I can, since that one's very UN specific, I can definitely take on that question. And thank you for that question, which I think highlights a number of things, including the powerful work that um, just black movements in the US have done at the international level to really push the conversation around racial justice and reparations forward in that forum as well. To answer the question of why the UN hasn't hasn't made the US account for um, its structures of, of injustice rooted in, in, in slavery and colonialism is because the US is a part of the UN and the US is a very powerful actor within the UN. And the UN itself is an institution that I repeatedly argue has to be engaged with suspicion because it is a geopolitical institution that itself reflects the kinds of power hierarchies that we're trying to fight against at the national level as well. Well. So if we're speak, speaking frankly, it's very contested terrain. And you saw this very vividly um, over the summer where, you know, George Floyd's family was at the UN petitioning for intervention, including through an international commission of inquiry into the situation in the US into his death. And the US was able to leverage its geopolitical strength at the UN level to basically make it impossible for there to be a commission of inquiry. So part of the reason why we haven't seen the kind of powerful action that we would want to see at the UN is that the most powerful actors within the UN are precisely the nations that need to be held to account for colonialism and slavery. And that's a very real constraint on what we can achieve in that context. That said, I think that um, 
there are still things that can be done at the UN level that are really important, and I'll highlight two of them. One is I think the UN platform is one that is really power is a, is a really powerful one for transnational coordination and collaboration. So I mentioned the World Conference Against Racism and the Durban Declaration that was produced there, which reframed the conversation around racial discrimination in the UN in really powerful ways. And so I would encourage the person who asked that um, question and even you know members of and Cobra and other groups who are doing really powerful work to not give up on the on the UN as a site for connecting with other groups and other parts of the world that are fighting similar struggles and from whom strategies could be exchanged in ways that I think change things at the local level. Another concrete way in which I think domestic uh, racial justice advocates can take advantage of the UN system is through the treaty body system. So we have the Interna International Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which actually provides for individual petitions and, and you know you can bring claims at that body for, for violations of, of human rights at the local level, I mean at the national level. The challenge right now is that the US has um, hasn't um, allowed, it hasn't signed the provision that would make it possible for American citizens to be able to make those claims at the international level. But this might be something that, you know, if there is a change in administration in, 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 in the next year, you know, depending on who's in power, it might be that part of the claims that racial justice advocates are making in the US is removal of those kinds of barriers at the international level for, for relief, you know. So ensuring that national conversations around racial justice are also thinking about how to open up international pathways for seeking remedies and making that polit a political pri uh, priority domestically, I think would also make a difference. But in short, I think the truth is that the UN itself requires um, it needs to be remade. That institution needs to be remade in ways that might make it a more powerful place to advance racial justice, but it's also a platform that we can't entirely give up on. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that one before I go to the next question? I'm not qualified to add to that. That was incredible. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, oh, you've read, did you want it? No, I agree. Um, so the, the next question is, uh, from what I understand, transitional justice initiatives, including reparations, are usually thought of as one, addressing a specific time frame in which the harm was done, and two, addressing demonstrable quantifiable harm. How can the framework be used to address harm that cannot be causally linked to specific oppressive acts, but instead are the result of ongoing structures and practices? And maybe I'll hand this to you, Raj, and then anyone else who wants to answer. Sure. Um, I mean, that is one of the central debates and reparations, right? Um, as it happens, we have a time horizon uh, available in this country. Um, people will be familiar with the 1619 Project and its claims about the salience that slavery and Jim Crow and separate but equal have had for contemporary American society. Um, those claims are, again, not, those kinds of claims are not unique to the United States. Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission from 2008 looked from to, looked at residential school systems from the 1860s to the 1990s and their relevance for today. Uh, so Philippines had a went back to pre-1521 colonial era abuses, right? We have uh, TRC examples from other countries that managed to look at these very complicated long-term uh, forms of systemic injustice and still come up with meaningful proposals for how societies can deal with them. So I don't see the, the time horizon, how expansive it is, or the causality as being insuperable obstacles to having these conversations. I'd like to attend eye on that one. All right. Um, the next question, I am very curious about this question as well, so I hope we can get all three of you to respond. Um, so this person asks, I'd be grateful to hear panelists' reactions on the intersection between restorative justice, 
via reparations slash stru structural reforms versus the calls for individual criminal prosecutions of bad actors, police officers who kill black people, Trump era officials who implemented family separations, etc. It seems like many of the reparative measures the movement is seeking specifically are looking to dismantle carceral structures, while calls for prosecution legitimate and entrench those structures. Respond. <laughs> Isaac, can we start with you? <laughs> I was already unmuting because I had a feeling you were coming here. <laughs> uh, and that is a hell of a question, uh, whoever asked it. And it's, it's one that I uh, grapple with pretty regularly. My, my mentor uh, is Dr. Kelly Lado Hernandez, who has been an abolitionist for the last two decades <laughs> uh, and wrote the book City of Inmates, really questioning the rise of mass incarceration here on the West Coast. And when you look at these systems of harm through an abolitionist framework, uh, that question about utilizing them against bad system actors, prosecute killer cops, right? That is another BLM chant, uh, along with defund the police. Uh, for me, uh, I believe that if we're going to get to the society that we deserve, if we're going to uh, reform our society, redesign our civic institutions, particularly the ones that have been weaponized against a black, brown, indigenous and poor folks, uh, then we can't uh, embed ourselves in repurposing them uh, to, to be used against those who have benefited from them. We have to abolish them and reimagine and rebuild and re, uh, redesign. That's the position that I come from. I do understand in the moment, if you are Miss Helen Jones, the mother of John Horton, or you are the father or uncle of Grishario Mack, or you are Wakisha Wilson's relative, right? Or any of the other just 400 to 500 folks who have been killed just here in Los Angeles. You are a relative of Dijon Kazee, who was killed by the sheriff's department uh, just a few weeks ago, who had autopsy found over 13 shots in his front and back, right? I can understand how you want accountability and accountability in the structures that we have designed today includes prosecution which is so often used against us for the smallest of things, but is never used against those who have oppressed, uh, particularly system actors, lethal system encounters. It is never used in that way for accountability. And so I, I do understand those calls, but I think if you're thinking transformatively uh, and we take a step back, then we have to be willing to, to push beyond uh, those calls for retribution and accountability that, that ultimately entrenches the need for those systems in our society. We've got to, to dream bigger. And, and I think the defund movement uh, is, is one of those examples where if we get the dollars that we deserve repurposed for care, opportunity and healing, and we take it out of systems of harm and oppression and subjugation, uh, we can head towards the society, society that we want. And so that's my personal uh, perspective on that question, but it's, it's an amazing question. Yeah, it is an amazing question and, and really one to grapple with. And I wonder, Tendai or Yavraj or both of you, sort of in the international context, when there's, you know, a, a different scheme for prosecution, right? And there is the ability to sort of prosecute people for mass atrocities versus an individual bad actor. Is there a difference there? Is there something to be gained there? So you know and i i also want to state that this is this is my take on this and this is not something that is resolved by any stretch of the imagination but i have to agree with 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 what isaac said and i think that applies in the international level as well you do have an international criminal justice regime that has emerged which focuses on prosecuting people for mass human rights violations. I mean, in that context, I don't think that issues of systemic racial injustice rooted to colonialism and slavery have ever been pursued. We might ask ourselves why that's the case. And I think it has something to do with the fact that, you know, criminalization of and, and focus on individuals is just such a poor way to address structural injustices and oftentimes those frameworks end up being wielded in ways that reproduce the power hierarchies that you're supposed to be fighting against as well so i'm not a big fan of the international criminal justice framework because oftentimes a lot of resources are 
are allocated to the persecution of individuals, whereas entire nations are left behind in ways that I think the transitional justice framework, for example, has been attempting to leverage alternative structural interventions that actually shift power um, in really meaningful ways. One of the biggest criticisms of the International Criminal Court is that it's focused, you know, most of its attention has been on, on Africans, for example, right? When you have international, um, and when you have mass violations being uh, perpetrated by the U.S., by, uh, you know, leaders outside of the U.S., uh, outside of the African context, but the way that power operates at the international level is that you basically see, I think, a racialization of the inter international criminal justice framework in ways that speak to the dynamics that we're attempting to undo in the domestic level. And the difficulty is there are individuals who are responsible for really you know, heinous crimes. And they are other, they are people, including survivors of, 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 you know, mass atrocity who view, you know, kind of punishment, individual punishment as a mechanism or as a, as an intervention that they value. So I don't want to discredit that um, either. I think as humans, we have different ways of responding to the horror that can be inflicted by other um, people. But if we're thinking about regimes that are going to deliver us to more just societies that are going to shift power in the ways that we want, I, I think doubling down on the international criminal justice regime um, is a mistake. And again, that's my take on, on, on thinking about it at that level. I don't know what Yuvraj thinks. He may disagree with me, but... Um, I'd be interested to hear his perspective, not to call, cold call you on a, on a webinar, but. <laughs> I, I wouldn't dare disagree. Um, so, I mean, I think the balance balancing exercise here is criminal prosecution versus structural change, right? Uh, which occurs in the domestic and international terrain. The only thing I would add is um, the most common justification for criminal prosecutions is accountability and query what kind of accountability that promotes. Certainly it may be individual accountability, it may you know, be thought to have a deterrent effect, but is that the, and which is by the way, you know, may or may not be the case uh, for other countries, um, but what about collective accountability? What about structural accountability? Uh, not just individuals, but institutions that sustained uh, subordination and oppression, if the trade-off is that you have criminal prosecutions and nothing more, that seems like a pretty poor bargain to me. Yeah, and I'm, you know, you all have sort of touched on, you know, the reparations is, you know, a, the attempt to address harms done primarily by the state, right? And so what are the ways in which we can try to divest the control of the state from, from accessing reparations, from engaging in these processes? How do we give the power back to, to communities and those most impacted? I think you start with setting up institutions and decision-making processes where those who have been most impacted have a, a seat at the table and even more than a seat, but a, an active voice in the decision making. Uh, and I think in a, in a tangible sense, uh, it means moving dollars <laughs> from systems of harm and placing them back into community controlled mechanisms. Uh, and our civic institutions and our electoral and political process, at least here domestically, has, has often ostracized or uh, marginalized, suppressed the voices of certain communities. Uh, including those who have had contact with the criminal legal system that was designed to re to uh, subjugate and break their bodies and then relieve them of their ability to participate in the civic process. And so you have to recenter all of that where you put folks who have been most impacted back at the decision-making table and you move resources in such a way uh, that the decisions at that table can redirect uh, those resources towards areas of, of most need and areas where they can do the most good. Um, but in my mind, that is how you uh, attempt to mitigate that. And if we're not talking dollars at this point, for me, we're not having a serious policy conversation, whether it's reparations or the defund movement or any uh, conversation about the way our civic institutions are organized. I personally am, again, my personal opinion am, am past the superficial reform stage of this conversation. Uh, and, and now we need to talk about structural change that requires a different kind of civic investments in our communities. 
I completely agree and would add um, something that the report touches on and that I think is an important dimension of the reparations conversation, which is reparations by non-state actors, especially corporate actors, right? At the international level and even domestically, they are corporations that benefited in immensely from slavery and colonialism and whose kind of descendant corporate entities exist today. And you have corporations that benefit from racial discrimination in the present. So Sophia Noble, who is also at UCLA and who's at the, who with Sarah Roberts founded the uh, Center for Critical Internet Inquiry has been talking about reparations in the context of kind of tech companies right now and the racially discriminatory structures that they are presiding over. I think it's important to to decenter this. Well, it's important to hold the state accountable. It's important to empower communities to self-determine in ways that don't rely upon the state. But I think it's also important to bring attention to corporate actors who benefited in the past and continue to benefit from racial discrimination, and to, to say that they also should be held um, should be held to account. And that's. An international law, a very difficult prospect because you, it's difficult to hold corporations liable for violations of international human rights law, but that's not an accident, right? And, and this is one of the calls that I make in the report, which I keep coming back to, which is that part of the problem is that the legal regimes themselves need to be restructured in order to deliver the kind of reparatory um, interventions that are required, but we shouldn't lose sight of corporate actors because they... Um, are very big players and and and, are, and have a lot to account for as well. Echo all of that. I think just on the theme of uh, empowering communities, uh, it's important to put mental health and psychosocial considerations on the table. Participation in reparations conversations, TRC conversations, we we hope that they will be healing, uh, but they can actually be quite the contrary, right? They can be re-traumatizing, they can challenge people's coping mechanisms for dealing with personal, daily, generational harms. So one insight from transitional justice in places like Sri Lanka and elsewhere is that we, we need to provide psychosocial support and take psychosocial needs into consideration throughout, from the beginning of the process to the end, um, and that includes not just support for individuals who are involved in these conversations, but for families and communities, without which, you know, we may not be able to have some of these fruitful conversations. Thank you so much, all of you, for the, the thoughtful engagement of those questions. This is going to be the last question. So if you'd like to answer and then give us any parting thoughts, uh, how do you balance the need to take time with reparations and not accept something that is too limited with the scarce opportunities to seize an opportunity for the political will to get something done? Tendai, would you like to start? Oh, Isaac, you unmuted yourself. I saw you. <laughs> I, was, I was looking at the, my other panelists uh, in their eyes to see who was going first. Um, with things that are this important, for me, it's important that we do it right, uh, which is why the one year time frame for the reparations task force in California concerns me. You cannot rush um, something that's this important. That doesn't mean to say that you don't act with urgency, right? With the seriousness uh, to move things, but you, you can't rush a process that is over 400 years in the making here domestically. Uh, there's a lot to consider. Um, that being said, political windows are what they are. And so you do have to find that balance uh, because a well thought out process or set of proposals that isn't acted upon, isn't accepted or endorsed by those in decision-making uh, structures of power and influence uh, doesn't go anywhere. How you do that balance, uh, I think in this country, I think that if we suspect that what happened this year, this is the last time an unarmed black person will be killed by our law enforcement institutions, right? That this is the last time our civic institutions as they're currently designed will will produce a lethal outcome that disproportionately impacts black, brown, poor, and indigenous communities. If this is the last time that we think a public health crisis is gonna expose the fissures 
and our social safety nets that drop too many black, brown, poor and indigenous bodies and communities. Uh, I don't believe that to be the case. I think we have the time to do this right and that this window, albeit one of the most powerful in American history, more people marched this year than at any point in American history. Uh, and I think that's uh, part of the reason bills like the Reparations Task Force move forward. It's why defund the police calls move forward. But this is table setting. This is foundational. And we have to do this right. Uh, and I suspect other policy windows will create themselves. And we also have the power to create our own windows. And I guess that's what I will leave us with is that people power and grassroots mobilization has always sparked change. And so as long as we stay engaged and we don't need another eight minute video of a, of a murder in front of our eyes to stay active and engaged and attuned to the decision-making that's happening in our local and national communities and international communities, uh, then we can force change whenever we want to. We can elect the right folks, we can stay active and engaged, we can propose the right policies. Uh, and here in California, we can take stuff directly to the ballot every single year, all right? We have the power to change the material conditions of our lives and those around us. And so as long as we stay active and engaged, uh, we can do that. So for everybody watching, you are already active and engaged for being here, but I would encourage you to continue to, to study deeper and find additional ways that you can get involved in these issues that you clearly care about and that we all care about. And thank you, Isaac. Before the last two panelists respond, I, I do, and I apologize that I missed this question in the Q&A, but there was an additional question if you'd like to respond about um, if Japanese Americans were the sole recipients of reparations from the U.S. government as well as Native Americans, why is it so difficult for reparations to be solely for descendants of American slavery? I know that, um, or I believe that some of the upcoming panels will also focus on this question, but if the last two panelists wanna address that question as well, sorry to throw in so many questions at you at the end. Tendai, you wanna go next? Sure, um, to, to go to the specific question that you just asked, you know, if, if other groups have received reparations, why can't there be reparations for um, people of African descent? I, the way I see it is that I think all groups, I, I feel, I think that people of African descent absolutely require reparations in this country. Um, and I think that in addition to that, there has to be an undoing of the structures of racial injustice that were created by slavery and colonialism. So this goes back to my earlier point that there is no one single intervention that is going to undo those structures. And we really need to have the kind of commitment and attention at all levels to see that longer process and to put things in, the, in that context. And they have to start somewhere. So I do think people of African, should, African descent should absolutely get reparations, but I think that's not the end of the story. Um, but to go back to the the final question that you put to us and i want to take that question in a different way i think one way to read it is how do you balance the pursuit of ideals while also taking advantage of strategic opportunities that present themselves even if they don't get you to the ideal that you had you know from the perspective of lawyers and legal academics and legal advocates i would say we have invested far too much time in taking advantage of strategic opportunities. And that has kept us, I think, in the reform frame. And I think one of the things that has been the most powerful about the defund movement is it has shown just the transformative power that comes for asking for your ideals as your starting point, you know? And so I would say you still have to balance those two things for sure. But from a legal perspective, I think our profession has invested far too much time in the strategic opportunities and less in the ideals. And, and one of the things I'm trying to challenge myself to do as a law professor, for example, is to think about what it might mean to teach law school classes that are more about ideals, that are more about reimagine societies and how we might get there rather than the focus on mitigation and kind of plugging the holes of a system that is designed to produce um, injustice. So I think, yes, we have to keep our eyes on both prizes, but right now I think there's been the skewing towards taking advantage and prioritizing the short-term gains over the longer-term gains. And we're at a moment where we're being reminded of what can happen when you insist on the ideals in the present. Thank you, Tendai. And Yuvraj, please close us out. Well, um, 
completely echo what Isaac said. The political windows are small often. We already see in polling that support for Black Lives Matter has reduced from the time in June to October, right? People's attention spans, politicians' attention spans can be quite short, which is why it's important to turn these moments into movements. Take whatever political window you have and make it as emancipatory as it can be um, and set up the structures, set up the reparations council, uh, transitional justice mechanisms, more enduring measures that can continue the conversation beyond the moment is key. Thank you all so much. This has been incredibly informative and generative. I thank you to all the attendees for joining and please stay tuned for the next two events in this series.